Captain Bush. Stand by the starboard battery. One broadside into it, if you please, Captain Bush. Point of on target. Lynn stops ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire. <laughs> Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's Indomitable Man of the Sea, Horatio Hornblower. in memory, and my sluggish blood still stirs within me at the recollection of the problems which faced me as we rode slowly into the maritime port. Slipping quietly down the river disguised as fishermen was one thing, but to enter this busy port in our homemade uniforms as Dutch customs officials and to plan the stealing of a craft in which we could make our escape to sea was quite another. As we rode casually along under the eyes of the dock workers and loungers, my pulse was high and the palms of my hands sweating. I forced myself to remain impassive and to sit with careless ease in the stern sheets. What's that noise, sir? Chain gangs, Mr. Bush. Unloading grain. Military criminals, deserters, and so on. Now that the French no longer use galleys, they put their criminals to work in the docks. I beg your pardon, sir, but uh, ain't that the blue ensign underneath that tricolor? Uh, on that cutter yonder. What? You're right, by heaven, Brown. It's tattered and faded, but it's the blue ensign right, right enough. Yeah. Isn't that like the French, flaunting their petty triumphs for months? Oh, this is a lovely little ship. There's speed and seaworthiness in those lines, Mr. Bush. It's the witch of Endor, sir. What? Oh, I know her anywhere. Ten-gun cutter, caught by a French frigate last year. She's ready for sea, too. <laughs> Take a closer look at her, Brown. Lay us alongside that key over there. Excuse me, sir, but uh, surely you weren't thinking... I mean, those cutters carry a crew of 60 men. Three of us could never work her. I knew that what Bush said was true. I knew more. The estuary of the Loire, which lay between us and the sea, was tricky in the extreme. For fear of raids, all boys and navigation marks had been removed. Without a pilot, we could never find our way through 35 miles of shoals without going aground. Besides, there were batteries at Berth and San Nazaire. As much as I should have liked to steal the Witch of Endor and sail her to England, the thing was impossible. I walked up the steps of the quay and forced myself to swagger. Bush's wooden leg came tapping up behind me. A passing group of soldiers saluted my smart uniform and the star of the Legion of Honor, which had been lent to me by the Comte de Grasse. I stopped and looked at the cutter from the landward side. Only an anchor watch. Two hands and a master's mate. The rest of the lovers are on shore. Look, sir. Here's another American ship coming in. He's just edging into the quay. It's infuriating. What's the use of all the coastal blockade if neutral ships can sail in and out with impunity? Wheat is officially non-contraband, but it's more important than arms in many ways. Oh, mm. Hello. He's someone coming ashore from the new arrival, sir. Civilian, for the look of him. It's the pilot. If, it... if he... The pilot. 
Uh, Miss Bush, I, I believe I've got an idea. Uh, listen, follow me and don't say a word. Now. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to speak to the pilot. Uh, uh, one moment, monsieur, if you please. I, I'm a colonel of customs. I have some questions to ask you. Will you kindly accompany me to my ship for a moment? Oh, yes, which is your ship, colonel? Over here. This cutter, yonder. This way, if you please. You are a newcomer to this port, I thank you, colonel. I was transferred here yesterday from Amsterdam. Oh. <clears throat> here we are. I'm after you up the gangplank, sir. Let's see. The mate of the Witch of Endor showed no particular surprise at our arrival. He evidently knew the pilot by sight, and my uniform and my assumed confidence deceived him. I told him that I wished to examine one of his charts, and he showed us down the companion to the after cabin without a word. The securing of the two men of the crew took but a moment. The sight of my pistols was enough in itself. Then, leaving Bush and Brown to watch the prisoners, I put away my pistols and hurried back to the quay. Sergeant! Bring your party down to my ship. There's work for them there. Yes, Colonel. So keep those chains still. And listen, men. Listen. If you'll do what I order, I can set you free. Now, quiet, quiet. There'll be an end of beatings and slavery. I'm an English officer. I'm going to sail this ship to England. In England, you'll be rewarded and a new life will begin for you. Now, I'm going to unfasten your chains. Now, sit still. Sit still. Make no noise until you're told what to do. You're free. Now, any man moves at his peril unless he's ordered to do so. which had begun my desperate plan till the chain slaves were freed, barely 15 minutes had elapsed. Yet in that time, our prospects of escape had increased a hundredfold. But the greatest peril still lay ahead. I had no mind to be taken and shot as a spy. I sent Brown to our little boat, which still lay at the quayside, and he brought back the parcel containing my own clothes. My own uniform coat was sadly crumpled, and the gold lace was bent and broken, but... There was a strange comfort in donning it once again. I was myself again, and should we be retaken, the wearing of a British naval officer's tunic would protect us from the fate of spies. It was time for action again. I took a belaying pin from the rail and walked slowly to where the sullen pilot sat on a hatch. I weighed the pin meditatively in my hand. Monsieur, I desire you to pilot this ship out to sea. But no, I cannot. No, no. My, my duty, my professional yes. honor. I know, I know. We're going to start now. You can give instructions or not as you choose. But this I assure you, monsieur. The moment this ship touches ground, I'll beat your head into a paste with this belaying pin. I, I. Oh. Very well, monsieur. Brown, lash him to the rail there. Then we can start. All right, sir. Mr. Bush, may you take the tiller, if you please? Aye, aye, sir. Now then, Brown. Listen, we've got a raw crew. We shall have to put the ropes in their hands. Cast off the warps. Aye, aye, sir. The push of the tide was swinging the cutter away from the quay as the warps were cast off, and Brown ran briskly among our wretched crew, leading them to the halyards and showing them upon which ropes to haul. At my order, mainsail and jib rose. The sails flapped, bellied, slapped again. And they filled the cutter changed from a dead to a live thing. She healed a fraction, and I heard the musical chuckle of the water at her bows as her forefoot bubbled through the water. In three strides, I was at the pilot's side, the laying pin in hand. Careful, monsieur. Keep to the right. Keep well to the right. Port your helm, Mr. Bush. We're taking the starboard channel. Major. And keep her at that. You must have a hand at the lead, monsieur. It is necessary to deck sounding. No, I can spare no hand. Sir. But you'll have to do your work without sounding. And remember, my promise still holds good. I shall have no mercy. Oh, these cords, monsieur, they are tight. Good. And we'll have to keep you awake. 
I'll loosen your cords when we are safely at sea off Noirmoutier and not before. Oh, it is necessary to cross to the other side of the estuary here. The channel narrows on this side. You may have to go about. Ah, stand by to go about. Look lively, you awkward lovers. No, not there. Stop us. Oh, lovely, lovely. To the right. There, you, you're perishing. Oh, Where do you think you're going? I think we can do it close haul, sir. She sails like a bird. The tide's helping, too. Very good, Mr. Bush. Ah, yes, she's making a cross. Ah, well done. Oh, let her come up a little. Hmm, beautiful. All right, Brown, we shan't need to go about. How's the pilot, sir? Is he behaving? Yes, up till now. I think the threat of the belaying pin was more effective than a pistol. No, whether I could have brought myself to club a helpless man, I, I, I don't know. A lot would have depended on it, sir. Yes, all our lives depend on it. I've started this venture, Mr. Bush, and I'll stop at nothing to achieve success. We've a long way to go before we're safe. If you'll excuse me saying so, sir, this is about the most amazing thing even you've ever done. Uh, to recapture an English ship and sail her out under the very nose of the frogs? Well, I, I, I'd never have believed it possible. Well, it isn't done yet, Mr. Bush. Time to keep that firmly in mind. We'll congratulate ourselves when we're safe. Oh, I've got the to stop us now, sir. Why, if this wind holds just for... Oh, what's that? Seems to be below. Brown? Aye, aye, sir, I heard it. I'll go below and see what's up. I don't understand it, sir. Surely there couldn't have been some crew aboard that we didn't find. Look out, sir. It's the prisoners below. They've slipped their lashings and they're trying to attract attention by waving and yelling through the portholes. Can I take some men to deal with them, sir? Will not be necessary, Brown, unless my ears are mistaken. They're coming to us. I shall have something to say presently about the way they were tied up. Men, arm yourselves with whatever you can find and make no more noise than is necessary. Unless these prisoners are overpowered, we are lost. You will go back to slavery or death. Mr. Bush, remain at the pillar. Brown, take my pistols. I shall use my sword. Hold on, go with your Tiller been wrenched from him and the cutter beat, we should indeed have been lost. But my participation was not necessary. Weak and wretched as our chain gang crew were, they glimpsed the hope of freedom and were prepared to fight to the death to retain it. With belaying pins and bare fists, they fell upon the four attackers and the struggle was brief. This time I personally supervised the tying up of the men and had them laid out on deck where they could be watched. Then all hands were sent back to stations, and our run down the estuary to the sea and freedom continued as the night closed down. Curse it, sir. I was afraid of that. What? The wind's dying with the dawn. Yes. Can't make out where we are in this mist. But I expect the sun will clear it when it comes up presently. That's Noir Moutier to port, and the mainland is astern there. I caught a glimpse of the semaphore station ten minutes ago. If only the wind had held for half an hour more, we should have been safe. That pilot looks in pretty bad shape, sir. Mm. Well, so do you, Mr. Bush. It's 24 hours since any of us had any sleep come to that. <clears throat> However, I'll keep my promise and cut him loose. There. <clears throat> You're free, sir. Oh, my eyes. My legs. Well, sit down on the deck and rub them. You'll feel better presently. Oh. It's no good, sir. I can't hold the course. There's no breeze at all. Blast. The tide will drift us in under the big guns. Brown, wake up those slaves on deck there. Set them to work with the sweeps. Aye, aye, sir. Here. You. Come here. Come here. Come on. Come on. Right beside me. 
Now, come on, you're going to help me to train this gun. But, monsieur, my honor, I cannot fire at my fellow countrymen. Mr. Bush, have the kindness to toss me that belaying pin. Oh, no, 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 What am I to do? Well, lay hold of that train tackle. Come on, now. Come on, run her back. Oh, beautiful, sir. Nearly got him. Right up among the oars. Sweeps are ready now, sir. Very good, Mr. Bush. Lay a course so that I can keep that leading boat under fire. Aye, aye, sir. The pursuing boats, creeping over the sea, showed no sign of being dismayed by my bombardment. They were big ones, carrying at least 50 men each. If only one and ranged alongside, it would be the end of us. The leading boat maintained a course which could cut ours perhaps a mile ahead. I fired again and again, working at the gun till my shirt stuck to me with sweat and the powder grains irritated my skin. But I could see no result. You must have hit that time, sir. I didn't see any splash of the shot. No. Oh, oh, rowing as hard as ever. Oh, good heavens, is it possible that a six-pounder can have no effect? I thought so, sir. What? Look. Yeah. She's swinging round. Uh-huh. She's signaling into the others. She's thinking, sir. <laughs> Variation in each ball, each charge of powder, made it impossible to fire two shots alike. I kept grimly on, though I felt that my back and heart would break. The monotonous creak of the sweeps and the chanting of Brian continued like a submerged accompaniment. Now the second boat turned and began a rush under double banked oars straight for our ship. I stared through the gun sight straight at its bows, jerked the lanyard, and fired. Even as I watched, the bows of the boat opened like a fan. The shot had struck her right on the stem at water level. Her bows lifted as the strake spread wide, then fell again. The water poured in, gunnel deep. I think they've had enough, sir. The last boat is turning away to pick up the survivors. Thank heaven. I'm sick and tired of firing that damn pop gun. Uh, I'd rather use a bow and arrow. Come on, pull her. We're not out of danger yet. I knew lay the British fleet, which maintained an unceasing watch over Brest. I had laid the cutter on a course which would take us out to the fleet eventually. Or if we missed the fleet and found a wind, I could sail her right round to England. An escaping English captain retaking a captured ship of war practically single-handed and fighting his way out of a French port to bring her home. Oh. <laughs> There's never been anything like it, sir. Never will be again. But I was not listening. The mention of England had renewed all my old doubts and fears. If I returned, I must stand my trial for the loss of the Sutherland. If I were found guilty of not having done my utmost in the presence of the enemy, there was only one penalty, death. And then... A breeze! A breeze by thunder, sir! Out of the east! Only a whisper with a breeze! One...
Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers.